Hi, I'm Dr. Todd Lee with MindMuscle.com. I'm a medical doctor and 2012 IFBB North American Lightweight Bodybuilding Champion. I'm going to talk to you today about IGF-1 LR3. Now, this is almost a category in itself when it comes to anabolics. So you normally have your anabolic steroids or your pro-hormones that are used to bind to the androgen receptor to build muscle. Then there's also the growth hormone category, where they're injecting growth hormone or you're in injecting GHRP6 or CJC1295 in order to cause natural growth hormone to be released. Those are two different mechanisms of approach. And then there's also the insulin category. Insulin works through a different receptor. It binds at the GLUT4 transporter on muscle cells and fat cells to force carbohydrates, amino acids, and creatine. Now, there's ways of doing this naturally, and there's ways of just using injections. And what I postulate is that with IGF-1 and LR3, you pretty much obviate the need for insulin. Um, it doesn't necessarily fill the insulin slot exactly. It just makes it useless, and you don't really need to deal with insulin. So IGF-1, LR3 stands for insulin-like growth factor type 1, long, R3. So... Let's break that down a little bit more. There's two different IGFs. There's IGF-1 and IGF-2. They found that IGF-1 works better. Um, and the LR3, L stands for long because it's synthetic, chemically modified version of IGF-1. They added 13 amino acids to the N-terminal, and they swapped out position 3 in the polypeptide chain um, for an arginine. That's R. And it's position 3, so it's 3. So that's why you get IGF-1, LR3. For the rest of this video I'm going to just refer to it as IGF-1 because I'm lazy. Now, why did they do that? Why did they chemically modify it? Is because normal IGF-1 has a 10-minute half-life, whereas IGF-1 LR3 has up to 12 hours. So it stays in your system longer, and they found in research to be at least two times more effective to have that longer half-life. Now, GH is reputed to cause both fat burning and muscle building effects. The truth is GH doesn't directly build muscle. What it does is when it gets broken down, its byproducts indirectly cause an IGF-1 release. And that IGF-1 release circulates throughout the whole body. Now, in a resting state, the IGF-1 is preferentially going to bind to the intestines, the spleen, and some believe the heart. So that's where you get that pregnant look that a lot of bodybuilders have, is that they're injecting the IGF-1 or the growth hormone in a resting state, either first thing in the morning or whatnot, and that's going to bind more to these organs than it will to muscles. Now, a activated muscle, one that's been damaged through training, that is going to be your anabolic window. That's going to allow for IGF-1 to bind to that more efficiently. Now, IGF-1 is released intramuscular inside the muscle cell, and it does a whole bunch of crazy stuff that's just amazing. Normally, the way you activate it is just through brutal hard work. Also, I believe the estrogen receptor alpha causes it to be upregulated, and testosterone or uh, SARM like trenbolone will also cause it to be upregulated. So what it does is it increases the amount of glucose that goes into the muscle cell, increases the amount of mRNA that's generated from the, de um, from the nucleus. So the DNA gets converted to mRNA. The mRNA goes through your ribosomes. The ribosomes ends up converting into polypeptide chains. Those polypeptide chains are then formed into proteins. Those proteins are now your proteins of muscular contraction, like acting mice. So it un increases protein synthesis. It prevents protein degradation. It increases the RNA, as I discussed. It decreases body fat. Now, that's a weird thing, is that it makes sure that the fuel is, is available for all the changes it's doing to the muscle cell. So... Like GH, it burns fat and builds muscle. It just, in my opinion, it seems to do it better based on the data that I saw. Um, it increases GLUT4 expression. So GLUT4 is a transporter that insulin binds to on the muscle cell to transport in the carbohydrates, to transport in the amino acids, to in, um, transport in the creatine. So that's going to upregulate that. So it's basically turning on all these machinery inside the cell to make the muscles bigger. So it's going to open up the doors to let more nutrients come in, and it's going to also open up the doors in the fat cells to let more nutrients out. So it works in every way you'd want it possibly to work, but that's not all. Um, some research shows that it causes increased hair growth.
that includes the stuff on the top of your head. So there's falling out, IGF-1 might help with that. And I don't know where this comes from, but there's a belief that it causes testicle size to increase. So if you go on IGF-1 while you're on cycle or post cycle, it should help you with maintaining natural testosterone functioning and you know, testicular health. <clears throat> so, and what else do we want to talk about? And band dose. All right. So like any peptide, there's all types of opinions about dosage. That, that's one area about peptides that make it not as good is that it hasn't been, they haven't been around as long, so there's not as good of an understanding of how to dose it correctly. So like GH, it can cause bones to continue growing. So if you've ever seen some of the pro bodybuilders, they look like pregnant cave people, that they've got this big gut and they've got this broad cheekbones, big broad jaw, broad fore, forehead, and those types of effects, some believe they're called GH gut or GH face. And that's from the fact that in the 80s when GH was used, they used way too much of the stuff. Now people are smarter about it. They use just a little bit so that they get some fat burning benefits from it in the area injected. Um, other people believe that it's just not worth it just to stick to um, GHRP6 and CJC1295. So with the IGF-1 LR3, if you inject it sub-Q under the skin, it's going to travel everywhere, So, which means it's going to go to your organs, which means they're going to grow. Um, another way of approaching this to make it work better is to inject it in the muscle. But the issue with that is the muscle gets blood flow. So some believe that within 10 seconds, it's going to travel through your whole body. So let's use some common sense here. If I want to make my calves bigger, does it make more sense to inject my stomach or my calves? Even if it's going to travel everywhere, I can't see that it's going to work better in my calves if I inject my stomach. So why not just bite the bullet and inject the calf? It's the common sense approach. Um, it just makes more sense, especially if it works best in damaged tissue. And if the receptors are more um, receptors for the IGF-1 are more expressed in damaged tissue, that would make sense that whatever you just worked is be where you want to put it. Um, then as far as the dose, like, so some believe that if you go with 50 micrograms a day, it's going to cause down regulation of receptors. So the more you take, the less effect it's going to be. Um, there's two ways to boost the receptor density, betaine, and some believe trend can boost receptor density. But nonetheless, you're going to get down regulation anyway, two different methods. So what makes sense is keep your dose under 50. Now, cycle length is supposed to be between 21 days and 50 days, depending on where you look. It's all over the place. Just like the dose ranges from 10 micrograms a day to 120 micrograms a day. So if we've established that it's 50 micrograms a day or less, and you want to ideally go in the target work muscle, even if you're using it every day at 40 micrograms a day, it would take 25 days in order to hit 1,000 um, micrograms or 1 milligram. That's what it comes as a package as. It's a small vial that will have one milligram of dry weight IGF-1 LR3. You're supposed to add 6% um, acetic acid solution to it, injecting uh, about three milliliters in there um, against the side of the container. And then that'll dissolve it and also take the um, IGF-1 out of the pores that are in the inside the glass now, any more detail than that is probably criminal. And more importantly, if this is new to you, it's probably not something for you to use. I want to kind of just point out some key concepts here, a common sense approach. This is not a terribly effective drug to use as your own drug. This is something that you add to a cycle that you've already, you've already plateaued. You've already gotten everything you can get out of anabolics or out of pro hormones. This is something that professional bodybuilders do in order to get the best results. The reason why I'm doing the video about it is because a lot of people don't understand it because there's a lot of controversy because there's not a lot of data on it because not a lot of people do it because it's so advanced. And it's not a lot of yield for the money and for the effort of procuring it, preparing it, using it. It's just a total pain in the ass. Like you have to carry it in an ice pack and take it within a few minutes of working out if you want to keep your organs from swelling. And the fact that you can have permanent side effects, such as intestinal growth, spleen growth, heart growth, then you permanently have a pregnant distended belly. 
it's really not worth it unless you're super meticulous with the preparation and you know exactly what you're doing. So if you're watching this video to learn how to prepare a peptide that comes in the mail, then you probably shouldn't do it. So I'm not giving any approval on the use of this compound. I'm just trying to give education. Um, I think that all comes down to it. The last part is if you do order it and if you are using it, you don't know what you're getting is what you pay for. That one way to tell if something's real or not is the side effects. So like GH, it makes your knuckles swell if you overdose on it. So intentionally overdosing on it to see if your knuckles swell will tell you whether it's GH or IGF-1. But it's not going to tell you if it's IGF-1. GH is a lot cheaper than IGF-1. So that means that they might have just put GH in it. So the next thing to look at is pumps. IGF-1 is supposed to give you insanely painful muscle pumps. So you would want to take it before you work out, even though that's not an effective time to take it. It's just a test to determine if it's effective or not, if it's real IGF-1. And even if it is IGF-1, it's probably going to be very underdosed. That the really hardcore IGF-1 is so expensive, and only one lab makes it, and there's such a protocol to get your hands on it, that almost everything is going to be a knockoff, diluted amount of China. So if you get insane pumps on it, then it's probably IGF-1, not G. If your knuckles don't swell and you're not getting insane pumps, spray some of it on a pregnancy test. And if it comes up as positive, then what you ended up getting is HCG. So you might as well use that as on site to keep your testicles larger. That's probably where the myth that the increased testicle size comes from is it probably cut IGF-1 with HCG to save money in the labs in China. That's where that probably that bizarre side effect comes from. Because that's a very reasonable thing for HCG to do, because that's why you use HCG is to um, on cycle therapy to keep your testicles alive because IG and HEG binds in the testicles like LH would. So that's Todd Lee with MindandMuscle.com. Thank you and have a great day.